know if you, if you know this, maybe you feel it too. I think the best example of how challenging faith can be, or maybe my favorite in the Bible, comes from Mark 9. It's the story of a father whose son was possessed by demons. And he and Jesus are going back and forth on whether it's actually possible for his son to be healed. And they keep going back and forth until finally the father makes this profound declaration of faith. I believe. Help my unbelief. The first time I came across that passage in scripture, my soul breathed a sigh of relief because, yes, just like that. I believe. Help my unbelief. And for me, it's been very much in that order. I grew up in a church, in a Methodist church. And so I grew up believing. We grew up coming to church pretty much whenever the doors were open. From Sunday morning to Tuesday night, back around to Sunday evening, we were there. We said blessings before meals, enough to pray before we went to bed. Faith was a natural part of my life. And it was simple. God is real. Jesus is real. Faith is real. But then, one day, as I got into middle school, unbelief snuck in for the first time. And it came in the form of a question. A very clear question. Is this Christianity thing real? Or does it just seem real because it's what I've been told my whole life? And once that question entered my brain, the scales of the childhood of faith fell from my eyes, and I couldn't stop the questions from coming. My head was full of questions. Do I really believe? What if I don't believe? Will I go to hell if I don't believe? Why am I even worried about hell if I don't believe? I rattled all these questions around in my mind and they drove me crazy. So I embarked on a very modest intellectual quest. One, because I was in middle school, and two, because this predates the internet and answers weren't easy to come by. So I decided I'd research other religions. And in my modest research, I actually came back around again to Christianity. I thought, sin clearly needs a solution. And there is a clear solution in the cross, in the payment that Jesus made for us on the cross. So intellectually, I have it. All right. I believe. I want to believe. But I found that faith isn't so easy to turn on and off like that. I couldn't just push a button and have it click into place again. And I struggled to regain the faith that I had lost when I started asking all these questions in the first place. So an adult, a mentor in my home church, heard about my struggles of faith and handed me a book. It's called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's written by a guy named Josh McDowell, and it is 387 pages jammed full of facts. Facts that McDowell says prove God's existence, prove the legitimacy of Scripture, prove the divinity of Jesus Christ. And even more to make his point, the book is not narrative. It's just one big outline. Just the facts, man. I clutched that book like it was some kind of religious security blanket. Oh good, here's all the facts. And if I read through, commit some of them to memory, maybe I can pile these facts up until eventually they pile back up to God and I've got my faith back. But it did not work like that. Even sitting there with the book open, looking at all these facts as McDowell presents them, my faith didn't turn that on like I expected it to. And I struggled. Now at this point in my life, I had just begun to read through the Bible. And at the advice of my youth director, I had started in the book of Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament, and worked my way through one chapter.
after a day, right before bed. So I'm pretty sure that at this point, I have not made it all the way to Hebrews yet. I had not come close to the end of the New Testament where it's found. I had not read this declaration about who Jesus is and why Jesus did what he did. I had not come across the scripture for today. Because if I had, I think I would have felt a little better. I would have understood better what faith is and what is not. In the scripture for today, Hebrews gives us Abraham as the example of what faith is. Abraham is an Old Testament figure, an early Old Testament figure. He pops up in Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham is 75 years old. Now, I'm not saying that's old, because I think that would get me in trouble. <laughs> but I'm saying if you want to have kids, that's old, right? Like, you've passed that time by a few years, you know. <laughs> Abraham and his wife Sarah had no kids. And we can only assume that this was heartbreaking for them. And we might also assume that because people are tough, they eventually lived through that heartbreak and accepted their lot in life to be childless. But then God speaks to Abraham in what should be the golden years of their retirement. And God says this, Abraham, I am going to bless you. I am going to make you into a great nation. I am going to make your name great. And through you and your descendants, all the families on earth will be blessed. That don't make no sense. <laughs> If you're 75 years old and you have no children, how can you be made into a great nation? If you're 75 years old and you have no male descendants, how is your name going to carry on at all? Let alone be great. If you're 75 years old and your family consists of you and your wife, then how is it that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you? God made a promise to Abraham and to Sarah that came with no proof, no evidence, no book full of 387 pages of outline proof, right? God just made a promise. And so Abraham and Sarah made a decision by faith to uproot themselves from what we might guess to be a comfortable retirement, living in their family's inheritance, and instead go out onto uncharted territory to live into an adventure with God. Even by the time they died, Abraham and Sarah had one child that would carry out this promise, just one. One child that does not a mighty nation make. Even at their death, they didn't see the evidence that this promise would come to fruition. And yet it did. And they had faith. That's what faith looks like. Not loads of evidence. Not exhibit A, exhibit B, proving that something is true. Faith is more like a leap, a jump. A gap that has to be bridged, where no amount of evidence can pile up to complete it. At the beginning of the chapter, Hebrews says it in a very beautiful and memorable way. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So eventually, I jumped. And what I did, I was at a youth week event. I grew up at a, a biggish downtown church with a biggish youth group. And for one week out of the summer, we had a team of college students who would come and take us to the beach and play silly games and do mission projects and uh, hopefully teach us a little bit about Jesus in the midst of all that. And at the end of the week, they put on a concert for us. They were led um, by 
that this guy named G. Spray, who's now a Methodist minister and also a very talented musician. So the concert they put on was the real deal. They did a good job. And at some point in the concert, in between silly hand motions and all sorts of other things, there was a serious song, a solo that G did, just him and his guitar. Now, I don't remember what he sang about, except that it was something about God. I don't know any of the lyrics. I have no clue. But I can remember clear as day the expression on his face how his eyebrows were furrowed and his eyes were closed, like he was concentrating very hard on something that couldn't be seen. His faith was all over his face. And that moment was like someone held up a mirror for me. And I realized as I looked at him and saw his faith that I did have that faith too. And I still had all my questions. In fact, more than ever. I did not and still do not totally understand the nature of God. The questions have not gone away. But in that moment, I realized that I could say, I believe. Help my family. I think faith gives a false reputation. As though faith is supposed to be 100% all or nothing. But faith, in my experience, doesn't work like that. It moves from between 10% to 90%, depending on what kind of day I'm having. And there's always some gap, some leap to take in there. If you hover more toward the 10% side of faith, I want you to be encouraged that you can take the leap that our God is worthy of our faith. That you can choose to follow Jesus Christ even without having all the answers, even with a head full of questions. Because faith, after all, is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So may the Holy Spirit take your faith, small as it may be, Bridge the gap and make it grow. Today I want to invite you also, during the last hymn, the altar rail is always open for prayer. But I'm going to take the opportunity to kneel there and I'll be praying for anyone who may be here today who feels like they've got a faith about that big. I'm going to be praying for you. And if there's anyone who wants to come forward and kneel and pray with me to turn your small faith over to God, 